So the Saudi market isn't brain science to understand, but um, I'm going to be sharing all the strangeness of what this market represents. Uh, first off, I'm not sure if anyone's aware about reputation of Saudi. Like, for example, it is the second biggest importer of Johnny Walker in the world. Um, put your hand up if you knew that. Don't think so. Uh, how about it being the number one downloader of pornography torrents? Yeah, that's, these are rumors. So don't, don't quote me on that or anything. Um, but it's definitely a strange one, and you need to be aware of its idiosyncrasies. So basically, uh, how do I start with? I mean, it's very peculiar and random in its online habits as well. It's the second biggest market of Snapchat users in the world, and it's got the highest ratio of views per user on YouTube. So you've got these really weird consumption levels, but then on the other hand, um, in terms of Facebook and Twitter usage, they haven't ever taken a proper foothold. So um, when you're dealing with this market, you're dealing with a culture that obviously abides to a very radical form of Islam. So you have to take that into account. They'll be into some types of online platforms, but then other ones will simply not take any hold. Um, one other point about this is basically about half of Saudis are using prepaid cards for their purchases. I remember when I first arrived in Dubai about seven years ago, credit card penetration was about 15%. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was like this, this country was both stuck somewhere back 10 years in time, um, while the people there were still carrying three smartphones in their pocket and cruising around in Bugattis. Credit card penetration is now, I mean, seven years later, still around 25%, so super, super low. There's my breakdown of the games market in Saudi Arabia. It's based on the latest new zoo figures. Uh, so um, basically, starting off with uh, their figures for 2015 and 2016, I then go ahead and break it down into online browser and so on. I see some people crunching their eyes, squinting. I can, you know, of course, send this to you afterwards. Um, it's broken down by online browser, mobile games, PC and console, and then obviously the, the total. Uh, Saudi has twice the global CAGR, so the compound annual growth rate is twice in that market, rapidly rising every year. Um, it's 27th ranked in the world in terms of games revenue. Unsurprisingly, Apple makes two-thirds of the profits, even though it represents only 40% of the market. Um, this year, I, I basically project App Store to hit about 80 million and Google Play to hit about 40%. I ran a fresh gamer study for all of you here in Amsterdam. Amsterdam. So you're the first eyes to actually glance at these figures. Uh, there, uh, I think about an hour after this talk, you're going to see an article get published on TechCrunch that also um, refers to all the, all the facts and figures. But basically, 1,500 gamers respond to the survey with a very, very balanced gender split, pretty much 50-50. And we did that, and we controlled for that gender split so that you guys can actually see specifically how impressive the female gamers are in this market. Um, they might not match their male siblings, but they are still high-octane, high-spending uh, gamers. There's a pretty balanced distribution of age groups between 18 to 44 for the male gamers. However, for the female gamers, the, the age groups basically really, really lean to younger, younger age categories. Like twice as many of them are eight, under 18 and twice as many of them are under 18 to 24 as their male counterparts. There's a slide that basically shows that, that complete reversal a little bit on the age groups. The demographic gaps continue. For example, 66% of male gamers in Saudi are employed, and 15% are unemployed or students. But only 10% of the female gamers are employed, and 70% are unemployed and students. So obviously, that says a lot about the culture that we're dealing with here. Um, however, uh, I mean, still one-third of both groups have bachelor degrees, so there's, there's not obviously, like, it's, it's not forcing that kind of dynamic. It's more cultural as well, but it's quite interesting. Saudis like the usual top trending genres, you know, of action, adventure, casual, and puzzle. Um, but, I mean, they're really interested in seeing what the top game developers release. 
I mean, this is a big theme I want to highlight. Saudis want the Ferraris, always the Ferraris. That's a very Middle Eastern Dubai and GCC, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council. It's uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Oman, UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates, and of course, Saudi. Um, this is a big theme over there. They always want the best. They always want the Ferraris. So when you talk about localization and stuff like this, it's not really the key point. Um, they want what the big best developers in the world release, um, even if it's not localized. You won't be surprised that females prefer casual and puzzle titles and have less interest in, you know, uh, what you call it, the, the male dominant genres of strategy, sports, and racing. I mean, that's pretty much universal. In terms of frequency, half of total gamers in Saudi play several times a day. If we break this down according to males, and then look at the females, we pretty much only notice a very negligible difference between the two. Even though you just saw that huge demographic skew that makes them completely different in terms of age groups. There's no difference in terms of duration either, as uh, pretty much 10% of both genders play at least three hours per day or more. They are homogenous in their degree and depth of daily mobile gameplay. They're mostly influenced by word of mouth, and app ranking, just like gamers around the world. But keep a close tab on local like, influencers on YouTube and Instagram. They can do magic, so make sure you look into establishing ongoing relationships with those social channels. So here's the juicy stuff. Um, <coughs> paid downloads is about to like, slip into the single digit zone, and pretty much everyone downloads fr uh, free games. A whopping 42% of total Saudi gamers pay uh, for in-app purchases. So we got about half of them paying. This is a proper whale's den. Two-thirds, do you want to take a picture? No? Yeah, you have one? You want one? Um, so two-thirds pay less than $10 per month. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty normal thing, but then now you got 22% who are paying 10 to 50 per month. This is US dollars. Then you got 11% that are paying 50 to 100 per, uh, per month. I mean, this is, Pretty extraordinary if you guys are familiar with any normal market. 4% are paying $100 to $500 per month. And a whopping 1% killer whale group are paying that, you know, upwards of $1,000 per month. Even though revenue is less with female gamers as you would expect, it's still shockingly high relative to global standards. I mean, we got 8% of female gamers who pay $50 to $100 per month. We got 2% who pay $100 to $500 per month. And we got about a 1%, a little bit under that, who pay that $500 to $1,000 bracket. The country basically really holds true to its stereotype around the world as being a you know, bona fide whale's den. I also ran a B2B survey, um, basically that uh, targets professionals who have current and future interest in the Saudi market. Uh, these are basically split up between publishers and developers. Most of the 87 respondents were either marketers or business developers. When we asked if they were focusing on new titles in 2016 for the Saudi market, 62% said yes. Less than one third ever experienced any marketing challenges. But when I dug deeper into that, that question of challenge, it wasn't actually any problems, but really the trouble um, of figuring out what to do and how to do it. On the, uh, on the right, you'll actually see a, basically a ranking of how they have prioritized genres from their point of view of profitability. The majority of marketing campaigns for mobile game hits in Saudi and the Middle East in general usually never focused on the region. Success happens in the Sahara simply because the audience there, as I've said before, they follow popular global trends. They want the Ferraris, so you don't have to chase them for their attention. Just keep building the Ferraris and maybe optimize visibility in the right ways. Whether you do well in Saudi does not depend on a focus on the market at all. You don't need to go and work with people in the region who, who say that the, you know, they can give you the, the hidden tips and tricks to, to do it well there. Um, in fact, half of Saudis are not even using the Middle East app stores. I had an article written about that on VentureBeat and it was taken down about 10 hours later because App Annie's lawyers got involved. Um, basically, it's not attacking App Annie, but it's attacking this phenomenon of dual stores. Uh, Saudis don't, half of Saudis do not want to use the Middle Eastern sterile experience of everything being filtered. They don't want that. They want what the best games are. And so they'll actually turn on their VPN if they have to, just like in Iran. 
Uh, that article is actually was reposted on wamda.com if you want to read what was so controversial. Uh, there are exceptions like Lumba's tribal rivals, but they're just that. They are exceptions which relate to specific conditions that made them a success, and they can't be used as reliable case studies. There are local titles that do occasionally make it to the top 20, the top 15, even the top 10, but I mean, they typically focus on, on, on local sites and PR, and it's a totally haphazard approach because their games are simply mediocre compared to foreign alternatives, and no local focus is going to be able to change or compete with that fact. But if you do want to, you know, have the resources and the inclination to localize um, for simply the fact of maybe optimizing your metrics in Saudi, then here are the guidelines. Your storyboard has to be sanitized to some extent. Okay, so that's basically just common sense because you are dealing with a very radical form of, of cultural Islam. Um, but uh, it's not really as mandatory as it used to be, especially when you're dealing with app stores. Um, what you can do is improve your KPIs by, by following these types of guidelines, and then basically what it does do is improve your KPIs with that other half of the player base who do actually use the Middle East App Store and are sensitive to localization. Gamers are like beggars, in my opinion, especially in the non-English world. 40% of Saudis are fine playing in English, so you don't have to translate your game immediately. Go ahead and localize there in English. They will, you will have find a very good mix of them who do use it um, and who will play it. Uh, Clash Royale, for instance, you think the Saudi base is not going to be playing it just because it's in English? This does depend sometimes on content heaviness. If your game is like a full duty content heavy RPG, then certainly that it will probably benefit you if you go one step further. Um, one thing about the text boxes, if you are translating to Arabic, obviously do try to make it RTL, right to left, but the entire game experience does not need to be. The game UX can stay LTR or left to right. Try to tiptoe around the topic of religion, and you can simply do this by adjusting this, the storyboard script while you're translating to Arabic. One thing I, I need you to really, really take into account when you do go translation mode is uh, work with a copywriter who is familiar with Saudi's particular dialect and lingo. The gamers in Saudi, especially if your game has some narrative, they will notice that and they will appreciate it, and it will go to some extent in making it more viral. Don't think that Saudis or Middle Eastern in general are looking for more deserts and more dish dashes, those the white robes and stuff. I've met a lot of uh, game developers who think they can change the artwork to be like, you know, really like Middle Eastern. They don't want that. They don't want that. They want to be in the experience we all want, which is games make us escape reality, create our own identity in some other fantasy world. Like I said before, half of Saudis, and who are, in my opinion, are the more tech-savvy, uh, heavy-duty, higher-spending variety, don't use the Middle East App Store. They use the US App Store or other foreign app stores. Um, and they're accessing non-filtered content anyway, and you won't be able to use App Annie, sa app Annie sadly, to track a lot of that split of the revenue in the activity, which is why it made it controversial. Um, so what that means is you're going to have to allocate a lot of your or at least half of your marketing to local ad networks and preferably 100% Arabic sites because outside of games, which is a special exception, Saudis do prefer non-English content. And the last point I would say, aside from any questions you might have after this, is to really, really look into local YouTube influencers like Saudi Gamer who has over a million followers and over 160 million views. Um, Try to figure out how to get the attention of guys like these. Exposure there can definitely be priceless. Thank you. All right, well, I have one question. Um, if, what is the number one piece of advice, top, most important piece of advice that you could give to a developer or publisher that's trying to bring a game from the Western market to uh, the Saudi Arabian market? What would probably be like the number one tip or piece of advice that you would give them? Yeah, start minimal. Start step by step. Don't think you need to make put all these resources together. Simply uh, launch in English, but have your banners and, and your marketing assets translated. That way you don't have to do it, uh, do that much effort to basically get some initial KPIs. And then you have your own data-driven um, path being kind of outlaid for you. Hi. Um, I was wondering, if you want to localize your game, um, would they, um, you talked about that you uh, should use the uh, Saudi dialect, but is it a huge problem if you use Middle Eastern standard? Their no. Middle Eastern standard? 
The point about the dialect is, uh, especially for the marketing campaigns, maybe for the marketing assets, definitely use their dialect and try to you know, um, go more towards their slang because it will, it will have more of a reaction. But in terms of the game script, no, it's Middle East standard is fine. If the game is content heavy, like a real you know, proper AAA title with a lot of narrative, then I would, sup I would suppose that Saudi being the most important market in the Middle East, that should be the Arabic you use for the whole Middle East, right? Because it is 20 million versus like a million in UAE, a million in Kuwait. I mean, Saudi is where all the money is, right? So it matters less how many players you have from the rest of the GCC. Saudi is your primary top focus. That's the whales then. And you guys can just let me know. I'm sure Casual Connect will provide uh, um, the presentation, which I'll provide them in PDF format. But if you need anything else, you can email me at amir at gameguys.com. Thank you.